And so this is going to be Clemens uh, Lay and Maria Laura Tardivo. Am I saying that right? Y'all are my friends. I've eaten with you like three times, and I'm not sure if I'm saying your name correctly. Laura is the CTO and co-founder of Bitcoin Computer. She holds a PhD in parallel and distributed computing from the National University of San Luis, Argentina. She's been a tenured professor at the National University of Rio Cuarto and has contributed extensively to industry and academia, specializing in high-performance computing and optimization. Clemens is the CEO and co-founder of the Bitcoin Computer. And uh, y'all are both co-founders, right? That's a, that, of the same thing. He holds a PhD in computer science from the University of Oxford, specializing in database theory. Since leaving academia, he has started several companies in Litecoin. 2018, Clemens started the Bitcoin Computer to bring trustless smart contracts to Litecoin and other UTXO-based blockchains. And for the heck of it, what is trustless? Requiring no one to trust? Yeah, you don't have to trust a human. You, you don't have to trust a human. Exactly. Like yeah. the, the code and the protocol will take care of it and you don't have to trust anything. Yeah, just like in the, in the Bitcoin white paper, the, uh, uh, white paper, the second sentence is, Hold it um, you, you know, all the benefits are lost if a, a trusted third party is required. Right, right. So the right, whole right. point Like of gravity is trustless. Pretty much. Yeah, yeah. I got it. Okay, yeah. cool. Y'all's for it. Thank you. Well, many thanks for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure for us to be here. We are going to show uh, how to build a vault in Litecoin. I just so, have one for the Okay, first, uh, I want to uh, give a, a classification of what, what is a smart contract. And we classified smart contracts in three different groups. We know that we can build tokens like NFTs, fungible tokens, and stable coins. The other group of contracts uh, are swaps, like atomic swap or the classical order books. And then we claim that uh, anything that is not a token or a swap, it's a vault. For example, we can, uh, we can have games or DeFi, like automated market makers, lending protocols, uh, or in general speaking, financial technology like payment automation or a regulatory technology. And so um, a vault is uh, defined formally as a smart contract that releases cryptocurrency once a condition is met. This condition can be as simple as a predicate or as complicated as a program evaluated to a specific condition to be met. And for examples, uh, examples of, of vaults that we have currently could be a game where, for example, players uh, play some wagers, at the beginning of the game, that could be cryptocurrency of, of, of US dollars. And one, once that the game is finished, the winner of the game gets the, get the wages. Another example that we have is a bank loan settlement that in general are um, agreements between institutions that are not standardized in contracts. But you can, you can think of a bank loan settlement as a general a state machine where different participants participate, uh, update in the state until some final state is reached. And once this, this final state is reached, the funds are released. And another example of uh, a vault can be the performance right organizations. Uh, and how this works, this works um, these organizations uh, know and determine how are the rights of the, of the artist and which, um, which rights they, they, they have and the percentage of the rights of an artwork. And so uh, contents provided, like for example, Spotify, su submit sets of lists of the play recording of these artists to these organizations that in general are distributed around different countries. And uh, these organizations calculate with a big amount of big data uh, who are the rights um, go and then distribute these, these funds. So we can see here in these three examples different uh, computation uh, capacities. For, for performance rights organizations, we require a lot of computation. For bank loan settlements, sometimes we can, we can say that it's uh, a tiny amount of computation required. And from games, the range can be from small amounts to big amounts, depending, for example, on 3, 3D rendering games. Uh, how we currently could, could do vaults in the UTXO's set uh, blockchains? Well, the, the, the current approach is BitBM or LitBM that we have heard recently in the previous talks. Um, that is uh, a, an amazing innovation. But there are some efficiencies that we need to be aware of. And then uh, we want to highlight two main efficiencies of this system. That is, uh, first, the storage um, is inefficient because for, to store one bit, we need 512 bits of Lampert signatures to be stored on chain. And uh, the other inefficiency that is not minor is that um, every miner has to execute the contract. So uh, due to these two inefficiencies, the system is expensive. 
And in general, uh, these solutions are used with rollups, which leads to a centralization and does not contribute to the security of the uh, L1, given that the fees uh, of the systems are, uh, are moved from the miners to the, the centralized rollup entity that uh, validates the transactions. So then uh, the question is, how good can Lycum be compared to Ethereum, for example? And so we know that Ethereum has a stronger support for minor executed smart contracts because uh, the underlying smart contract system is Turing complete compared to the scripting language that is restricted for, for efficiency purposes on Lycon, right? And, uh, but also we know that the role of efficiency depends on the, on the smart contract capabilities of, of the underlying L1. So one would, thi one would think that uh, Lycon can be, as bet, uh, can be at best as good uh, as Ethereum. And then uh, we claim that Lycon is much better for smart contracts than, than Ethereum. And this is a claim that we, we want to explain right now in this talk. And since, since Clemens tweeted this, I will give the, the microphone to Clemens to explain why we think that Lycon is much, much better for smart contracts than Ethereum. All right, thank you. Um, so, so, yeah, the question is, how can Litecoin do better, right? And sort of Laura has argued, if we're kind of relying on, on miners to validate these smart contracts, then it seems impossible to beat Ethereum essentially at their own game, right? So we have to look at the other way to do smart contracts, which is um, called user-executed user smart contracts, right? In our, our opinion, that, that solution is far superior, and you can build scalable, trustless, and cheap smart contract systems like that. So let me tell you how it works. It's very simple. Users just add expressions to transactions. The expressions are usually just like little snippets of JavaScript code or, or any programming language. And then you compute the value from these expressions and you associate the values with these outputs. Right? So let me give you an example. Right? So here what you see is a transaction with an input and an output. And here on these slides, we're going to sort of you know, um, you know, uh, symbolize the, the owner of an output uh, by its color. Okay. So, like I said, what we do is we add an expression. So this is just a little JavaScript expression. It evaluates to an NFT. We evaluate the expression, and then sort of associate the output with, with that value, right? And what's very important to note here is that while the expression is stored on chain, the value that is computed from that ex expression is not stored on chain, right? So that means sort of very efficient encoding of data, right? And now, if we want to update that data, we just do it the same way we always do it in the UTXO model, right? Unspent outputs contain the latest state of the system, and if we want to update that data, we just spend you know, the, the um, output that represents the old data into a new UTXO that rep represents the new state uh, data, right? And in this case, we're adding a little bit, you know, another expression here that we're calling like an NFT send function, and we're sending this NFT to the green user. So anybody can now analyze these transactions on the blockchain and come to the conclusion that the green user owns this NFT. Right? So this is how you would do NFTs. You can also do fungible tokens, very simple. You just use a JavaScript program that essentially evaluates to a number. Right? So in this case, we're recording that like, the, the, the brown user owns 120 fungible tokens. And then you know, to send these fungible tokens, it's again very, very similar to you know, the way that Satoshi's move. We create like, an, another output for the other guy. And sort of now in this case, you know, the brown user has 90 tokens and the yellow user has 30 tokens. Building swaps is also very simple. Swaps are typically you know, transactions with two inputs and two outputs. They spend the two assets that are to be swapped, right, and add a little bit uh, an expression that sort of, you know, swaps the owners. So after this, the, you know, once this transaction is, you know, included in the blockchain, the brown user will have the NFT and the green user will have the, the token. Okay. Um, oh, wrong button, sorry. Okay, so now we can sort of compare the minor executed smart contracts with the user ex executed smart contracts, right? So Laura has already mentioned that, like, you know, you know, at least in BitVM, you know, data and, and encoding data is very wasteful on, on BitVM, right? To encode one, one bit of data, you have to use 512 bit of um, on-chain space, which is, seems inefficient. Now, in the case of user-executed smart contracts, it's much better. You don't need 512 bits to encode a bit. You don't even need one bit. In fact, every single bit is compressed and stored in compressed way on the blockchain. And I told you before how it works. You only store programs on the blockchain, and the values that are computed are never even stored. Right? And then you can start thinking about how good is that compression right, compared to, say, the optimal compression. Optimal compression is something that's you know, called cologram of complexity, which is um, essentially the, um, the cologram of complexity of a piece of data is just the size of the smallest program to produce that data. Right? So you can kind of think uh, of it as like a, a, you know, a custom compression algorithm for every single piece of data. And sort of, you know, 
with, with these sort of user executed smart contracts, quite naturally, you know, programmers are sort of trained to, you know, write small programs. And so, the, you know, they, they end up storing data very close to the optimal compression, right? Data updates are, all, are also very inefficient in the, in the minor executed world because, like Laura kind of mentioned, every single smart contract is executed by every single miner redundantly, right? So intuitively, that doesn't seem to make sense. And it's actually a little bit worse, right? Because in, in, in many cases, most users, actually like 99% of users do not run a node, right? So they still connect to another node and trust, you know, whatever that node says, right? So it's really kind of an absurd situation where, like in Ethereum, there's like a million validators, right? If, if you want some code executed, instead of executing it yourself, you, you're paying a million other people to execute that code and you still kind of have to trust them, right? So that can't be the optimal solution. Right? So how does it work in user-executed smart contracts? There's no redundant execution whatsoever, right? Whoever's interested in some value, you know, evaluates that code, you know, that's stored on the blockchain, right? So there's no redundancy, and it's also 100% trustless. If you want to know, you know, the value of, of a um, that's stored on the blockchain, you just compute it yourself. You don't have to trust anyone, right? And if you think about it a little bit, that too is actually optimal. Um, okay, but now, you know, if you look at that, you, you kind of think, you know, in that case, everybody should be using user-executed smart contracts, right? Why is everyone using minor executed smart contracts? And it has to do with, you know, the, the, the smart contracts that can be encoded, right? And so obviously, on, you know, on Ethereum and with minor execution, you can build, like, obviously tokens and swaps, but you can build all these amazing vaults, right? So if you remember, like, literally all of DeFi, DeFi for example, is a vault, right? However, due to their inefficiency, you can, in fact, only do... Um, low computation vaults, right? So high computation vaults are still impossible on Ethereum just because they would be too expensive to ever evaluate, right? So in the user-executed world, um, I've showed you examples of both tokens and swaps, so both very easy to do. And so the reason why, why user-executed smart contracts have not um, sort of, you know, you know, seen much use um, is because people generally assume that vaults are impossible to do in user-executed smart contracts, right? And if you had asked me a couple of months ago, I would have also thought that user-executed smart contracts cannot do Vault, right? But, um, you know, it's kind of like a bit of a bummer, it's sad, right? Because all of these amazing smart contracts, you know, you know require Vaults. So, so it seems that we're sort of dependent on this inefficient way of, of execution, right? And, and in particular, if we could do Vaults in the user-executed world, right, we could unlock all these, um, you know, Vaults that require a lot of computation because now all of a sudden we have a much more efficient model, right? And so... What, um, what is the problem with building vaults on, um, uh, with user execution, right? So the problem is that with user execution, you have, on the one hand, you have sort of complete control over the data, but you literally have no control over the cryptocurrency, right? So in particular, I mean, miners are not aware of these JavaScript snippets in the blockchain, right? And so it seems like impossible to, you know, get the miners to send, you know, the, the, the money to the winner of a chess game if the miners don't even evaluate that chess game. That seems impossible, right? But so if you can't build exactly what you want to build, you know, let's just try to build the next best thing. So what we want to build is a smart contract that releases cryptocurrency once a condition is met, right? So let's build a smart contract that releases a token once a condition is met. Okay, let's see how that works. So there's two users, black user and a white user, and they both wager 10, um, 10 tokens on a chess game, right? So they broadcast a transaction that encodes the initial position of a chess game, right? And also importantly, it sets two pointers so it refers in, in, in some way to these two tokens, right? And then we update the tokens and refer back from the tokens to this chess game, right? So the tokens in the chess game are now entangled. Anyone can parse these, um, you know, the situation on, on the blockchain and, you know, can, can agree that these 20 tokens are now, you know, conceptually sort of um, bound up in this chess game. And the important step is, so the problem with these kind of constructions usually is that you know, the, the white owner still completely controls the, you know, the left UTXO. The black user completely controls the right UTXO. And the risk is always that, you know, if the chess game, you know, you know, goes in a bad direction for one of the players, typically they would just, like, you know, ignore all this JavaScript and just, like, spend their UTXO somewhere else, you know, thereby essentially taking their money out of the pot, right? But to prevent that, the trick is very, very simple. We just set the amounts to zero, right? And so at this point, you know, while, while the players still owe the UTXO, all these tokens are conceptually completely tied up inside that, that chess game. And the only way for the users to recover these, these uh, tokens is to play the chess game, right? So that's what they do. They broadcast transactions that update the state of the chess game. And then after a few moves, you know, in this example, 
you know, the black player wins, right? And anybody can analyze the situation on the blockchain and come to the, can come to the conclusion that the black player wins, right? And so, so now it's actually very easy in a, in a you know, user validated smart contract setting to sort of just, you know, add that capability so that the black user can call a withdraw function, you know, to, to evaluate that withdraw function, this load transaction graph needs to be um, evaluated and any user that does that verification will come to the conclusion that the black player has now won the, um, uh, the game, right? Okay, so we can build a token, um, a token vault. Let's see how that helps us to build a vault for cryptocurrency, right? So the only thing that we need at this point is like some tool to convert a cryptocurrency into a token, right? And then we, we play our, our chess game for the token, and then you take the tokens that you want and you take it back to, to you know, that tool that converts cryptocurrency for the token, right? So now the question to the audience is, does anyone here know some sort of smart contract, some sort of tool that converts cryptocurrencies into tokens? Yeah, but, but that's not available on Litecoin. But that is also not exactly. So, so I think the answer I was looking for is a DEX, right? So you go to a DEX, you, you, know, you, you pay some, some, some Litecoin, and you get a new token, right? So now if we combine a DEX with these you know, token vaults, we can actually do the vaults on, on Litecoin, and we can bring all these amazing smart contracts to Litecoin in a much, much cheaper way, and also in a completely trustless way, by the way. Right? So how can we build a vault for, for US dollars? Right? Now the only thing that we need is a stable coin. Right? So first you convert your US dollars for, to the stable coin, then you use the same construction to play you know, the, the game of chess you know, for the stable coin, and you take the winnings of your stable coin back um, to the stable coin provider and get your US, US dollars back. Right? So now we can check all these marks, which is, in, in my opinion, actually quite a big deal because now we can do, for the first time, in, as far as I know, in, in blockchain, we can do the side computation vaults at a very, very low cost, right? So I think that's great news, and this is only possible on the UTXO model, right? So that is why, you know, we think that Litecoin is much better for smart contracts than Ethereum, okay? So now the next steps, what we have to do is we have to sort of complete the Bitcoin computer. It's not a lot of stuff. We just, you know, we filled all the parts. We just have to shuffle it around a little bit. So I think we can get that done in a few weeks. Right, then what we, we have to do is we have to partner with a stablecoin issuer, right, which is kind of the preferred you know, uh, way of action. And uh, sort of alternatively, um, you know, we can build a DEX, which is kind of a bit of a regulatory you know, you know, you know, headache, but sort of the basic strategy would be that the DEX should list only commodities so that you're kind of regulated by the CFTC. You do only spot trading, so you don't need to register with the CFTC. You keep everything you know, non-custodial and decentralized, so you don't need to worry about money transfer licenses. And then you need to make sure that like, the issuance of the token is decentralized. And so, so we all know that the best way to do that is you know, proof of work. So stick around. So maybe we will you know, launch a DEX like that um, where, that will issue a new token based, off proof, based on proof of work that will unlock all these amazing capabilities for UTX or based blockchains. Right? So to conclude, is that, okay, you know, what we're proposing is actually not at all, in my opinion, exotic or novel. It's actually exactly how the world works, right? And so since we're in Las Vegas, I'm going to give an example of a, of a poker tournament, right? So think, think of a poker tournament, like 200 players, 10 tables, right? You know, if you get a bad hand, you just like fold and you don't pay further attention. But if you make it to the end of the hand, all the players that make it to the end will, ma will make that calculation in their head um, as to who, who won that hand. Right? And then the winner will also kind of, you know, make sure that they get the right amount of money, right? So there's no centralized kind of roller provider needed to, to check on all this kind of stuff. This is a completely, you know, decentralized user-validated user valid, uh, way. Las Vegas has been this for, you know, many decades with thousands of players and millions of dollars, and it kind of just works, right? So, so or other examples will be, you know, you know, restaurants and their suppliers, right? So, you know, every, you know, a bunch of restaurants in the city, a bunch of suppliers. There's no centralized entity that, you know, validates all all restaurant and supplier, you know, you know, contracts that they have. It's just like, you know, each restaurant hashes it out, does the user validation with these restaurants. So we think there's a very natural way of organizing things, and we just, you know, provide that kind of neat accounting on the blockchain, right? So, so the conclusion of the conclusion is that smart contracts can be scalable, trustless, and cheap, you know, without having to trust any middlemen or, or centralized uh, providers. Thank you very much. So if, you're, if you like this talk, please follow us on social media. If you're a developer, reach out. All our stuff is open source. We'd love to help you. Thank you very much.